Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. First time in Princeton. So, okay, so it's going to be another four dimensional symplectic talk now about Lagrangian submanifolds, but it's going to be very four dimensional. So, first, I'm going to give some background and uh, present the, the results. Uh, then I'm going to present to you the main construction that uh, the proofs are based upon, and that's something that we can call the splitting construction from symplectic field theory. Splitting construction, or sometimes called also called stretching the neck. And that's the sort of the main uh, tool. And then uh, it's c I'm going to describe roughly how to use this to construct some Lagrangian <coughs> Isotopies, so it's a classification. Uh, it's about classification results, and uh, Lagrangian isotopies are going to be one important step to construct uh, that is isotopies through Lagrangians of manifolds. And, and uh, I won't have time to talk so much about it, but but uh, in last step, I hope to be able to say a few words about how to attain some results about Hamiltonian isotopies, which of course are the sort of the the strongest form of classification that one would hope for in the, if one is interested in classifi classifying Lagrangians, usually. So, okay, so, so we, we know, I hope, that uh, Lagrangians are rigid, and let me give you a very uh, uh, apparent example of such a phenomenon, which was proven by Luttinger in 95. So, given a knot, in R3, uh, one can uh, construct something called the torus spin, uh, which is roughly going to be, so take S1 times the knot inside S1 times R3, and then take your favorite embedding into R4. And this admits a Lagrangian representative if and only if K is the unknot. So this is a very strong result, because on the other hand, there are, you can do this as an exercise. There are infinitely many uh, totally real such tori, up to, say, smooth isotropy. So I mean, totally real, then I have to choose a com <coughs> almost complete structure, and I choose the standard one. So, th so that's a uh, kind of dichotomy here, that totally real, such so fine age principle, but Lagrangians do not. So, for uh, zero parameter version of the H principle fail for Lagrangians embeddings. And, and I mean, remember that uh, two two dimensional surfaces inside uh, four dimensional spaces are uh, there are plenty of them. There's uh, complicated, more complicated maybe than not not in three space and so on. I don't know so much about this theory. Okay, next result that is going to be relevant for today's talk. So Eliasberg and Polterovich uh, have a part of this. And then also I'm going to combine this, uh, just for pedagog pedagogical purposes, with a new result due to Abu Zaid and Krag. This is from 13. And uh, using these two results, you, we get the following strong strong result, namely that if L is an a Lagrangian submanifold of the cotonet bundle of the two torus, so, so uh, I hope you're familiar with this. I think we, we heard about this r just recently now. I'm going to describe the context, the, the, the symplectic form later. But if, if this is a closed submanifold and exact as a Lagrangian submanifold, namely the Liville form here is the one form that is pulled back to an exact one form, then they, l, so Abu Zaid and Krag proved that L is homotopy equivalent to T2. In this case, it can be deduced by other methods, actually, classically. I mean, I think you can use something proven by Shevchichin, uh, who excluded Klein bottles inside here, and so on. But so, so, so they prove this in any submanifold. So L is homotopy equivalent to the zero section. Eliasper and Poltrovich now show that L is smooth isotopic to the zero section. So this is another such <laughs> failure of the age principle. Just one smooth isotopy class. 
Let me go on with the third result, which is relevant again. So Chicano in 96 proved that, first of all, in the vector space, the easiest torus that is Lagrangian you can think of is the product torus, or the Clifford torus, S1 times S1. Uh, and he showed that there's another torus called Chikhanov torus, LCH. And they have, uh, if you rescale things properly, uh, they have the same classical invariance. Uh, th they are actually even Lagrangian isotopic, <coughs> which means that there's a smooth isotopy through Lagrangians of manifolds. Uh, but not Hamiltonian isotopic. So this is another failure of the H principle, but now it's a, it's a one parameter version of the H principle that fails. That, that you know, so not, not only does the first the, the zeroth order fail, but also, so here, here there's sev several examples of embeddings that are not isotopic. So let me present this in, in, a, in a minute, but to, to go on, so, so the more I'm sure that many of you heard this recently, but so my office mate Renato Viana from Cambridge, so in a s s series of papers, he have extended this result now to, to, to show something for the closed symplectic manifold. So by the way, these examples kind of, they, they stay different also, of course, inside CP2, where you can put them, and uh, S2 times S2. And uh, Viana now showed that there are infinitely many monotone, let me not present what that is if you don't know it, because it's not, not going to play a big role here, Lagrangian tori up to Hamiltonian isotopy, uh, the, the most recent version of this in all symplectic thanos. I mean, say, CP2, S2 times S2, etc. So, so this is some the latest development of these exotic Lagrangian tori, some kind of extension of Chicano's torus. So let me quickly draw Chicano's torus because some of you might not have seen that. I'm sure most of you have. So I'm going to take a curve, and for simplicity, I'm going to take it inside the right half plane. And uh, but um, w what the thing is that the curve and its say minus the curve does not intersect that's all I really care about and for area purposes I want this to bound pi over uh, area pi over 2 and then this Chicano torus is going to be parameterized by theta 1 theta 2 mapped to say gamma of theta 1 thought of as a complex number complex scalar multiplied with the complex vector e to the i theta 2 comma e to the minus i theta 2 and there are, of course, many choices here, up to <coughs> cur curves, uh, isotopic classes of curves, and so on. But actually, there's just one parameter family of this construction, so <coughs> up to Hamiltonian isotopy. So you can just the rescaling is all all the, all the freedom that there release here. Okay. Any, any questions about the previous results and the constructions? If not, let's move on. Results. <coughs> so, first let me call this theorem A, which you can find in archive, and it's due to myself, Elizabeth Goodman, and Alexander Ivry, two students of Jakob Eliasberg, former students. And this is the following. So, inside the symplectic vector space, four dimensional, with a standard symplectic form. Say CP2 with the Fubini study, symplectic form, and the monotone um, symplectic S2 times S2, and actually, respectively, we will also have a result for T star T2 with the Liouville form. 
By the way, if, if you're interested in any details about what these symplectic forms, how they look like in some sense, please ask. I don't know what kind of background you have, so please stop me. Uh, then two, well, in this case, we have to say something more. We have to say homotopic, because there's some pi 1 there. Two homotopic, or in the other cases, is trivial. Lagrangian tori are Lagrangian isotopic. So in particular, they're smoothly isotopic. And uh, it's, it's not clear to me how big improvement it is to have Lagrangian tori that are smoothly isotopic. I mean, uh, they're Lagrangian isotopic, moreover, not just smoothly isotopic. Th that's not clear to me. I'm not aware of any examples where, where, where it in, in unless there's some, from, some, for some obvious reasons, that tori are not Lagrangian isotopic. Uh, on the other hand, <coughs> yes, it's, it's, it's a huge improvement, of course, from previous results. On the other hand, uh, as, as, a, as a, I don't know what, Lagrangian classifying person, you, you of course, you want Hamiltonian isotopic, not, not uh, Lagrangian. Um, so Viana's results tells us that it's going to be difficult to attain that in these some close symplectic manifolds, at least. But uh, in this case, T star T2, in certain cases, it's possible to actually get Hamiltonian for free now. So let me present you the following corollary. So if L is exact inside T2, so b by the previous results, we know that it's, uh, uh, for instance, it's uh, homotopic to, to the zero section. Then it is actually Hamiltonian isotopic to the zero section. And uh, yeah, so, so, so this result told you Lagrangian isotopy only. But actually, there are many symplectomorphisms of uh, T star T2 that can be used to correct a Lagrangian isotopy. So wh what is the difference between Lagrangian and uh, Hamiltonian isotopy? Well, th there's some kind of symplectic flux or re relative to the Lagrangian. Say the, 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 the symplectic action changes, but that can be corrected by using non-Hamiltonian symplectomorphisms from here, more precisely by fiber-wise translations in this case. Lagrangian isotopy is just a smooth isotopy through Lagrangian of manifolds. So for instance, there, there's a, there's a, this is an exact symplectic manifold. So if you pull back the level one form lambda here, it's, it's, it's a closed one form, starting and ending with a, an exact one form. We can correct this non-exactness by, by using fiber-wise translations in this case, because it's homotopy equivalent to the zero section. So what I'm trying to say is that this is just trivial. I mean, the Lagrangian isotopy gives, gives you everything. And uh, in all cases that we will see, this Hamiltonian isotopy will sort of come in that same way. So you, s you, you ha sort of have symplectomorphisms for some reason that can be used to correct your luck in some sense. Uh, so let's. Now present the second result that is uh, in the process of being written. So uh, this is an extension in the symplectic vector space. A Lagrangian uh, <coughs> torus in the symplectic vector space is actually Hamiltonian isotopic to either and it's going to be one of the previously known tori. Product torus, so S1 times S1, two different radii. And actually, I if we, up to the ordering here, R1 and R2, the pair, th these are <coughs> all different. So these are, yeah, up, up to these permutations are they're unique. Or a rescaling of the Chicano torus. And, and, and all of these are, 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 are distinct tori up to Hamilton isotopy, as was shown by Chicano. 
in his 96 paper. So okay, so uh, so so in sign R4, the story is uh, what we knew from the beginning. Yeah, exactly. So, sort of just a rescaling of uh, yeah, scalar multiplication inside R4. Because obviously, you always have these, and they are not Hamilton isotopic. So, so here we have the rescalings of the Clifford torus automatically. Okay. Uh, so, so, let me also tell you the following remark. Um, and this is due to. So this is based upon a result due to me, uh, Goodman and Ivory again. So if you take a Lagrangian torus inside CP2, um, then uh, it is Hamiltonian to uh, I'll say into the complement of the line at infinity. Uh, which is actually the same thing as the ball of some radius. So say with my usual convention, this is going to be the radius 1 over uh, square root of pi. Never mind. But anyway, it is the, it is, it is, it is the standard, it's the standard ball of some radius. And uh, recall now Viana's results that are not Hamiltonian isotopic inside CP2, they, they have the same classical invariance because they're all monotone. They're, they're also Lagrangian isotopic by, by our previous result. But they're only, so if you put it in the ball by this other result, then, then uh, they, they will become Hamiltonian isotopic. However, by Hamiltonian, that necessarily leaves the ball. So, so they're, they're, they will be uh, exotic only because the Hamiltonian is not allowed to use some extra space there which at first might sound surprising, but it's not so surprising because it's, I mean, it, it, in the other hand, you, you equivalently you could say that, okay, so they live inside CP2, but if we start to rescale them a bit to, to make them, uh, if you find some divisor in the complement and rescale them, then suddenly they become Hamiltonian, uh, they become Hamiltonian isotopic to either the Clifford or the Chikonov tori. So, so uh, yes, so it's not, uh, too surprising from that point of view, because of course, or we, we expect that things become flexible if you're, if you're allowed to not keep the monotonicity, of course, inside CP2. But yeah, a bit surprising still. Oops. Any questions? Yeah, so the next one, he, he constructed that by hand, actually, inside the a ball, so in, in the complement of a line. And uh, it has the same en enumerative invariance as the Clifford torus inside uh, one choice of a line. Inside, I don't remember if, if there was another kind of enumerative invariance inside the other. Maybe it looked like the Chicago from one point of view and the Clifford from another point of view. Yeah, so, so then by, by, by this result, it's monotone inside the ball bounds two families of mass of two disks, so, so it should then be Hamiltonian isotopic to the Clifford torus inside, not the ball, but inside R4. R4 yeah. So is that true for all the ones, on the other ones on the list? Is that they're all, if you put them in R4, they're all Hamiltonian isotopic to the standard? Uh, that will, no, no, that, that I don't think. So, so I think even it depends on which divisor you put. I mean, so the divisor is going to kill some of these holomorphic curves that, uh, the disks that bound it, and that should then depend on, but I didn't check that carefully, so. Okay. So now let's move on to the s central technique used, the splitting <coughs> construction. <coughs> So let's just 
begin with the following more basic. So just to take an, uh, a symplectic manifold X and uh, let's, let us be giving a Lagrangian torus inside there. And then, uh, well, the Weinstein neighborhood theorem tells you that there is an, uh, so we, we, fi we fix the parameterization we get an asymplectic embedding of the coat disk bundle of some radius, small radius 2 epsilon here, inside the symplectic manifold X. And uh, the, the zero section inside here is going to be identified with L. That's what I mean. And uh, yeah, I don't know, so, so for, for the sake of it, let, let's fix. We need to fix coordinates here anyway, so theta 1 and theta 2 are going to be angular coordinates on the torus that we fixed the identification here. P1 and P2 are going to be, uh, uh, say, angular mom momenta coordinates or canonical coordinates on the cotinent bundle, on the cotinent fiber. Uh, so, so, so if you want to see the Liouville form here, then it's uh, uh, going to be pi times d theta i. Right. Okay, but uh, so, so even more importantly, we're now going to describe a complex structure that we will use that has been uh, used before, I think. So the standard one, according to us, is going to be defined by taking the d theta i to it's going to be pretty close to the product complex structure, the integral one that you say, no, if we, if we identify t star t2 with c star times c star, but this is going to be a bit rescaled. So it's going to be minus rho, where rho is a function depending on the uh, Euclidean length of the fiber, uh, times the dpi. Uh, I'm going to describe this in a moment, this function, but also let me, we will also need the following, j sil, which is going to be a cylindrical almost complex structure. That's going to be, neither this one will be the integrable one that we know, but it's going to be minus the norm of p, simply d p i. And this is not going to be defined uh, uh, everywhere, it's going to be defined in the complement of the, of the zero section. It's not going to be smooth there. So, this, so, so, so you see that yeah, they're very kind of close. And actually, yeah, let's use this blackboard to, to draw some, quickly draw the function. So uh, here, so, so rho is going to be of the following form. It's going to interpolate between the cylindrical one and, uh, and this uh, uh, product one. So here, uh, it doesn't really matter so much, but, but okay, it has to be constant here. And this is rho. And here it's just linear, so that it's cylindrical. And uh, yeah, they're, they're both tame. Not integrable, but tame. Uh, they're very nice because it's, uh, yeah, you, you can actually solve many, you can find them in holomorphic curves explicitly here, which is, you're not gonna maybe see that today, but it's, it's used in the proof, so it's, it's useful. They're very symmetric. I mean, the, the, the action of the torus preserves them and so on. It's, it can be useful if you ever want to study some almost complex uh, pseudo-homorphic curves inside the cotinent bundle of the torus. I recommend to take a look at this. <laughs> uh, okay, so why do you call this cylindrical? Well, that's because it is cylindrical with respect to... Uh, this is with respect to the standard contact form, say, on the unit cotinent bundle of the two uh, torus for the... F so every Riemannian metric on the torus gives rise to a contact form on the unit cotinent bundle. A and this is going to be cylindrical to the contact form corresponding to the flat metric on the torus, where both, uh, yeah, they the say square, really the square symmetric flat torus. And that's going to be very useful as well. So now to the construction. So we have used the Weinstein neighborhood theorem to get this domain inside 
X defined, uh, identified with, with this uh, unit code disk bundle, uh, I'm going to consider first the complement of that inside X, and I'm going to fix some complex structure there once and for all, tame as usual. And then here I'm going to have codisk bundle, and I'm going to fix also some radius epsilon, so half of this radius here, inside a smaller piece here. And, and here is its uh, L, of course. It's a zero section. So now here's L. So here I'm going to have J standard. And on this color neighborhood, I'm going to have J cylindrical. <coughs> and the splitting construction, or the stretching the neck, will be choice of a sequence of almost complex structures. And uh, I'm going to keep it on these lower and upper parts, but I'm going to insert a longer neck here. And that's possible since it's cylindrical. It's, it's invariant under translation in, uh, of some Liouville uh, vector field. So <coughs> more precisely, let's identify uh, this piece here with some piece of the cotangent bundle, sort of the simplification of the unit cotangent bundle. And then I'm going to identify this with just a longer piece of the same simplification with some parameter tau, positive parameter. <coughs> and I obviously have it just a, can identify these two factors, my diffeomorphism. And uh, this is, of course, not the case in general. But s since this is cylindrical, then I, it actually means that you pull back this complex structure and you you get um, say a tame almost complex structure j tau here and this is this cylindri cylindrical cylindrical property of this almost complex structure so so this is a particular case of this neck stretching and uh, more generally, in, uh, you can do this whenever you have a contact type hypersurface inside a symplectic manifold. You, you have this kind of neighborhood looking like a symplectization, piece of the symplectization. You can just take this longer and longer cylindrical, almost complex structure inside there. Uh, in the case of a surface, this is just, I mean, uh, finding an annulus and, and excising that and replacing that with the annulus of larger and lar larger modulus. So your, your, your Riemann surface would, in the end, split into two. And this is a kind of higher dimensional analog of that for, for now in four dimensional case, for instance, but it can work in any case. Uh, any questions about the construction of all these complex structures? Uh, so what is the purpose of this? Well, the purpose is to make pseudomorphic, closed pseudomorphic curves inside the manifold X start interacting with uh, the Lagrangians of manifolds. So, so, uh, so, of course, pseudomorphic curves are very useful for studying four-dimensional symplectic manifolds. <coughs> but if you just have a closed pseudomorphic curve, it doesn't need to care so much about a particular Lag Lagrangians of manifold. The, the, the Lagrangians are way too flexible. And you can <coughs> perturb them in many ways. So of course, the pseudom pseudomorphic curves should not really be able to, to, to care so much about them. But this very violent limit will, will, uh, will, uh, will force them to do something, as we will see now. So, so this parameter t is going to be positive. And uh, in some sense, we're going to take the limit now as to make t go to plus infinity. OK. But first, let's recall the following classical result that was I mean, a crucial step in some of the results that you heard about in the last talk. So due to Gromov, so he, he deduces that the, these J tau holomorphic spheres 
in uh, well s2 times s2 the monotone one but also you can do this in cp2 so uh, in a class of minimal symplectic area. So in S2 times S2, the monotone S2 times S2, there are these two classes, S2 times point and point times S2, form a foliation. And in the case of CP2, well, that's after a point constraint. So th this is, of course, extremely useful. So by, by, by foliation, I mean, I really mean that we know the complete modelized space of these curves. Th they do not intersect. And so on, OK, in CP2, you have to be careful. And so on. So you, 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 it tells, tells you a lot about this. And this is, uh, yeah, I'm sure most of you know this, but it's crucial here that we work in the four-dimensional setting. In, in high dimensions, these techniques fail miserably due to positive to intersection. So it's, it's not. So, so, so what, the, what I'm saying is, it's really, I see no way to generalize that to high dimensions as these results, for instance, uh, shows, I mean, it's, it's very well known that these, it, it behaves differently in high dimensions. OK, so, so this is for every finite tau. So what is the upshot? Well. There is something called symplectic field theory and a compactness result, a very general type of compactness result inside this symplectic field theory. And let me s tell you a long list of names. So Bourgeois, uh, Ekholm, Hofer, Vysotsky, and Zehnder. And as well, I for this result I'm going to use now, also Chiak and Monke. Sorry for not writing all these names out. So it, it shows, uh, you using this uh, symplectic field theory compactness result, you, we deduce that a sequence of uh, j tau n, say, holomorphic <coughs> leaves. I mean, it's much more general than this, but I'm, I'm applying it in a special setting. And they assume now that tau n is a sequence that goes to plus infinity. Can actually be understood this limit, even if the complex structures do not converge in any sensible way to, to a complex structure on the closed symplectic manifold. But nevertheless, they have uh, so such a sequence has a C infinity locally in the appropriate sense that might not be uh, that I might, I mean, you might not understand it exactly, I think, but. In, in, in some appropriate sense, subsequent converging this norm uh, with the limit being a so-called pseudo-holomorphic building. Uh, in the same Uh, homology class. I mean, so it's in some sense, it's it, it should really be thought of as a broken representative in some sense of the same leaves. So let me pictorially describe what the pseudo-holomorphic building is. Well, we have a top piece that is going to live inside x uh, minus the Lagrangian submanifold, so the complement of Lagrangian submanifold. Observe that this is a, a cap in the, as we heard about in the last talk, it's called a, it's a concave cylindrical end. We're going to have another level consisting of, actually, there could be several such levels, but let me just draw one. <coughs> That's going to be the symplectization of this, uh, say, unit cotangent bundle of the torus. 
Uh, it could be several of those, but in, in, a, in the bottom I'm going to have the code science bundle of the two torus. And then in all these levels, it's going to be in the top level, it's going to be J infinity, which is going to be a nice, almost complex structure. R roughly speaking, it's going to be, well, if, if I just extend the cylindrical, almost complex structure all down to the zero section there, th then it's going to be exactly that complex structure. This one is the cylindrical one I described. And this is the standard one that I described also over there. And it's going to be levels then that consist of punctured pseudomorphic spheres. So let me draw it like this. So now they look like Riemann surfaces with boundary, but they're actually not. But <coughs> for some reason, I find it easier to draw it like this. So they're really Riemann spheres with finite number of punctures, r points removed. So let's see, and let's draw this. So for pedagogical purposes, some of these curves will not appear, actually. Uh, so first of all, 90% mm, I mean of you probably realize that this cannot appear. And this is just for the course, course of the maximal principle. So, so this is a, say, J comma. Uh, the, the, the simplexation coordinate is j convex. That's generally true. Doesn't depend on any of the geometric choices made here. So, something that is actually much more crucial here is that actually these planes, so one puncture, so, so the, these guys are all planes because the domain is just one punctured Riemann sphere, or I mean, in other words, the, the complex line or the, I mean the C. This will not appear because of the following <coughs> reason that uh, so, so, they, th so all of these curves are punctured, I don't know if this is visible, punctured uh, pseudo-holomorphic spheres. <coughs> uh, and at the punctures, there are going to be, th this is the important part now, there's going to be some very nice control, even if they're compact. They're going to be asymptotic. Two cylinders over uh, rib orbits. And in this case, rib orbits are with respect to the contact form for which this J sul is cylindrical, namely the contact form coming from the flat metric, and hence tautologically, rib orbits are the same as, well, lifts of geodesics. on flat, I'm sure you cannot see this now, but sorry. So ge geodesics on the flat torus, lifts of those. And that's extremely useful because, well, there are no contractible such geodesics. And this plane would then con 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 uh, construct a null homology or homotopy even of, of these. And that is why people before have uh, attained some strong results for some strong, ob strong obstructions for tori inside symplectic manifolds in general, not, not just in the four-dimensional case. This is ver very, very useful, as it turns out. Uh -huh. Not, not, not the Hamiltonian isotopies or uh, Lagrangian isotopies. I have no, no idea whatsoever how, how to do that, unfortunately. Uh, so actually, so I wrote something with uh, Johnny Evans before, where we also stretched the neck and and, uh, and got some smooth isotopy restrictions of monotone Lagrangian tori inside uh, C n for high n. So, so smooth isotopy is very different in high dimensions. So, but still, so, so, so and other people have also used. This result to prove, say, the Odin conjecture for Tora and CPN, and so on. So it's 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 really it's really useful. But but for say Lagrange and isotopy, I I have no clues whatsoever. What about uh, right. So same same thing there. I mean, it's uh, I, I guess it would be good to try to attack even say say the the cotangent bundle might be that might be simple. But but it's still it's. The, the the fact that the geodesics do not 
have, we will see that soon, that the fact that the geodesics uh, form a foliation of, of the torus is, is very useful for if you actually want the Lagrangian isotopy. You can maybe patch things together in some way, but I, I'm not sure. So in, in dimension four, I guess, it seems like we can prove many things if we just try <laughs> hard, but uh, how hard it is that I have no idea. <laughs> but of course, so we don't know. The so-called nearby Lagrangian conjecture tells you that every exact closed sim uh, Lagrangian submanifold of a cold channel bundle should be Hamiltonian isotopic to the zero section. It's unclear, except now in the case T star T2 and T star S2, all other cases, are, I mean, okay, T star S1, I guess. And basically all other cases are, are open. And it's not clear even, I think, what to believe. I think people have shifted a bit in their beliefs. And <laughs> if you ask different people, I think you get different answers. But okay, for, for, for in, say, in the two-dimensional for a surface, maybe we can do that. I'm not sure. It could be interesting maybe to at least settle that case. All right. So let's move on now and see how to use this to construct Lagrangian isotopies. So, uh, so what we did now, so, so the non-trivial input now is that Gromov gave us existence of a foliation of pseudomorphic curves. I mean, this is based upon the fact that we can, we can actually find a pseudomorphic foliation in the integral case by just solving a linear, a linear PD. And then, of course, Gromov tells us that his compactness theorem tells us that this foliation persists for any tame almost complex structure. We do this violent uh, stretching, and suddenly we get objects that are calibrated in some way, pseudomorphic <coughs> objects calibrated to the Lagrangian torus, which is somehow to, to solve the equation that tells you the existence of these objects is uh, completely impossible. You have to use Gromov's compactness and something. So, and of course, another question is, so, so, so Renato's result is not here anymore, but one could also try to, the, 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 so the crucial input will be this <laughs> foliation, and of course, we have some fa symplectic funnels here. One could also think about other symplectic funnels and uh, try, to try to generalize that. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the same kind of results are true there. <coughs> but okay, so let's try to, we have gotten some pseudomorphic spheres asymptotic to the torus, and let's try to use them for something. So we're going to consider their limits. And uh, the generic broken leaf And a leaf uh, is something that has Fredholm index 2 in these cases. So it's going to be coming a modelized space of expected dimension uh, 2, unparameterized. Uh, that's going to look like this. So in the first we have x minus l, and then we have t star t2 here. So we're going to have two planes. Planes have odd index and generically positive index, so it's going to be 1 plus 1, and that's 2. And that's actually, there's a 2 down there as well, but th 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 this index is, uh, th this is a bot situation, so there's also a, I mean, the tor the, 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 the geodesic all come in one-dimensional families, and there's a condition that these match up, so, so, so this, th this is actually not uh, free. Those two, th that 2 is just a 0 here, so 1 plus 1 is actually 2. Uh, th this uh, er, an analysis in this spirit tells you that any component in the complement of L, say in the top level, uh, is of index strictly less than two, which means that it cannot evaluate to an open set. I mean, it evaluates to some to some uh, chain that is a hypersurface, and hence the. The, the broken such leaves cannot pass through all the points in the space. On the other hand, there must be leaves everywhere in the space, sort of foliating it. I mean, it's, it's some kind of broken foliation in the limit. But, but, but anyway, so we, we conclude that the generic leaf, generic leaf, non-broken. I mean, it is still a J infinity holomorphic sphere embedded inside inside the limits, x minus l. And uh, 
I'm going to use that to construct the divisor. In the case of CP2, I, I take a line in, in my pencil that was not broken. In uh, S2 times S2, I take, say, uh, I have two foliations, and I take one, one leaf in the other foliation that, that then intersects the first foliation in, in, in uh, one point, every leaf in the first foliation in one point. So it's going to be useful to, to fix such a divisor. Of course, if I start inside R4, I already have the divisor for free. I just take it to be holomorphic when I compactify. Uh, but, but anyways, if not, if you're interested in this closed symplectic manifold, then, then you have to cr construct this divisor by this genericity argument. And this is also the reason why, if you can find a pseudo-holomorphic divisor in the complement of the torus, then Gromov's result actually gives you a Hamiltonian isotopy from this divisor to the standard divisor, maybe after tweaking it a bit. And then, then, then you put your torus inside the ball in that way. Uh, right. Uh, we're going to call these planes big. We're going to call these planes small. So, okay, so that was the generic broken leaf. So then the exceptional <coughs> broken leaf. I mean, so, so, so most of the job is trying to classify the possible breakings. And uh, it's a bit longer than it than it's might seem here. But you have to consider many different scenarios and use positive intersection, basically, to and some index properties to rule, rule out many of the cases. So the exceptional broken leaf consists of, morally speaking, a broken big plane. Which is going to look like this. And here's the divisor. And then, so these are two small planes, small and small. Something like this. Uh, and a priori, there could be another similar um, looking picture that would correspond to a broken small plane that I would draw like this. So, so this would be a broken small plane. Uh, But this cannot exist because you can check by, by index and area reasons that these two uh, cylinders, say two punctured spheres, would have to intersect by ho homological reasons. And that's not possible because the leaves cannot have, again, by positivity of intersection, even the broken leaves, you have to argue a bit more carefully. But you know, for, for non broken leaves, they cannot have self intersections in a foliation because of. Yeah, nearby leaves would then intersect too much. This is a bit more tricky now because it's a broken limit, but, but you can argue in the same way and say that this is a self-intersection and uh, this is forbidden by positivity of intersection. So th and that's a crucial step. Yeah, so, so, so roughly speak, yeah, why? So, so fir first step is to say that, OK, a priori, every out outer level is either a plane or an analyst. And then you can say that it must be exactly two planes and then maybe many analyze. But actually, th th the point is that by area reasons, these two cannot be, area and index reasons, these two geodesics cannot be uh, in the same class. They must be sort of non-collinear. And uh, the, the, so when you deduce that, these planes are actually just going to be, I, actually, you don't need all this, but, but, but my complex structure is chosen so that these cylinders are, are just complexifications of geodesics. And then they obviously intersect. But I mean, it's, a, it's a homotopy thing, actually. But, but uh, that's one way to see it, that these two asymptotics tell you that the, the, the cylinders intersect there. And now we're getting closer to this classification. What's the, what's the codimension of the exceptional ones? 
Uh, so from which point of view? You mean, uh, so, so to the... There's so no singular coordination. Yeah, so these are going to be rigid broken configurations. In, but it depends a bit on what you mean, because of... Oh, sorry, these, are not, these do not exist, I meant to say. But, but uh, you should think about these as uh, just rigid configurations. But it's not completely true because, whoops, this was a bit ugly. These are on the same footing. So, so these two have actually a parameter. I mean, they have a parameter that there are two parameters. One of them cannot be used because then you would uh, not match up again. But, but the translation, say, in the simplification direction still exists. But from the, out, from the point of view from the outside, you don't see that. So, so as a building, it has more directions. But, but uh, yeah, so that's a bit funny in, in some way. If you want to, if you want to try to say compactify the modular space or the foliation to something with a boundary, yeah, it's. Uh, I don't think of it in that way, but I'm sure it can be done. But, <coughs> but, but, uh, so okay. One way to think about this is that w what you would like this to do is to, you have your foliation, and in the end, you break. In the following way, which is a helpful, helpful picture, this is not going to be exactly what we are able to prove. But you should think of it as this: that the base is a sphere, of course, on the foliation. We fix this in kind of an identification of the leaf space. The the the, the co-dimension one strata are those that look like that over there, and these are spheres in the foliation where you see one closed circle. And then there's the finite number of leaves that are actually intersect in two circles, the torus in two circles. In, in the monotone case, say, then we don't have these self intersections. It's not so important for this talk, anyway. Uh, anyway, so the important upshot is that we can uh, still extract this solid torus that, I mean, here is infinity, that is disjoint from infinity here, the small planes, in some sense. And uh, yeah. That's what I'm now going to tell you how to do. And if you get a solid torus like that, it's fairly easy to, ex at least a smooth isotopy, to get that. So you have an evaluation asymptotic from the moduli space of small planes. And uh, actually, yeah, so, so, so sorry, so this I forgot to say. So, so the ex exclusion of these, sm uh, th these kind of configurations gives you that the modular space of small planes is compact. <coughs> Th that's not obvious a priori. By transversality arguments, it's actually yeah, an S1, say. I mean, we take a component that is an S1 a priori. Well, you can prove that it's, 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 it's precisely S1, but never mind. Take a component that is S1. Uh, sorry, I don't want to say this yet. We have an asymptotic evaluation to the, the family of uh, uh, asymptotic orbits. Think close to the ethics of the, of the asymptotic, that is an S1. Uh, this map is going to be submersion by uh, automatic transversality. Again, a four-dimensional result, in this case due to Wendell. Another important result that I learned from Hind and Lissy is that, well, <coughs> you can show that this is injective by their computation that uh, there's a positive asymptotic intersection uh, number for these orbits. Uh, and this I learned from Hind and Lisi. And uh, together, this is a diffeomorphism. So a priori it could be covering, but this injectivity means that two planes that actually are symptotic to the same orbit must be the same plane, because otherwise there would be a self-intersection, uh, not a self-intersection, there, there will be an intersection hiding inside that asymptotic. So if you push one plane off, it will be an honest intersection. And that's not possible because of the foliation principle. 
or foli foliation results. Uh, OK, so the evaluation map from this moonlight space, where the domain is, is just a copy of C, to this x minus L, uh, that can be compactified and smoothed uh, to give a solid torus uh, foliated by symplectic disks. So, si so since uh, I don't have too much time now, so, so just first uh, observe that this implies smooth isotopy. Just contract your torus radially to, to, to reach the core of this solid torus. B due to monodromy of the char characteristic distribution of this um, solid torus, you would like to do the same thing as in, in the Lagrangian category. So you, want, you would like to take a radially smaller and smaller curves of the solid torus and just find a, a Lagrangian torus inside the solid torus. That cannot be done because of a monodromy in general. So this, if you follow it, it cannot close up to Lagrangian torus inside the solid torus. But that can be fixed by, say, some non elementary, no, not elementary, but classical uh, techniques. Namely, we use something called inflation to give, give us enough space to fix this. So since my just have a few minutes left, one minute, maybe two minutes, so let me say a few words about the Hamiltonian isotopies. And uh, to give you a very, very quick outline of what is going to happen is that <coughs> let's consider the left shift vibration picture of the Clifford and the Chicano torus. So they are both given as these uh, tori, as you saw before, inside the base of this vibration, say z1 times z2. And uh, this is going to be s1 times s1, and this is going to be LCH. So this singular conic, uh, standard conic, c times 0, union 0 times c, plays an important role. And uh, what we're going to get is that uh, we're going to create a similar conic, pseudolomorphic, that either satisfies a property as the Clifford torus, namely that this is a homotopy equivalence, or satisfies the uh, property of the Chicano torus, namely that this is uh, homotopic to, say, a bit sloppily, the curve uh, e to the i theta comma e to the minus i theta. That's the homotopy class of the Chicano torus. And just in 30 seconds now, the plan for getting this is to say 1. Find pseudo-holomorphic conic linking L as either first or the second case. Gromo produces Hamiltonian isotopy to the standard conic. Third, apply Lagrangian isotopy inside C star squared, which is actually a convex neighborhood of the zero section of T star T2, symplectic embedding. And fourth, use uh, some elementary translation and uh, rescaling possibly, to make Hamiltonian. So, so that's the outline. And now um, my time is up, so thank you for your attention. <laughs>